Point tracking is great in DaVinci Resolve Fusion because it's completely controllable. So let's learn how to track even when patterns go completely off the screen, it goes off screen in the same direction or behind an object. It had information on that side of the pole, this side of the pole, and it figured out the motion path using a basic text callout. And then as a big bonus at the end, discover how you can actually separate your tracked fusion graphics from your background video layer so you can color correct your background video footage later on and never worry about making a compound clip. If you'd like to follow along exactly, pause the video right now, go to creativevideotips.com slash cutting club to download the source footage and project files and become a member for just $3. Okay, so the footage today, as I bring this in, you can see it's a guy walking across the street in New York. We're gonna track his head, but you can see his log footage. It's like flat, there's not a lot of contrast. So a good superpower that Resolve has is color management to bring this back. Down in the lower right, there's a little gear, click that. Go down to the third tab, color management. We're gonna turn on the color science to be set a wire GB, which is based on what you see is what you get. We're gonna give it a little bit more information by using DaVinci wire GB color manage and HDR. Click save and nothing happened, Chadwick, why not? Well, this is a ProRes clip. There's no metadata associated with it inherently like it would be if it was a raw clip. So, but we can tell it what the color space it was shot with. And this was a Blackmagic Pocket Cinema Camera 4K. So I'm gonna right click on the clip, go down to input color space. This is a new thing that will have appeared um, with having color management turned on. Go down to Blackmagic Design and we're choosing Blackmagic Design Film Gen 5. And now you can see, Everything looks more like normal, like you would have seen in real life, and it will track better because there's contrast there. Now to get into Fusion, just click the Fusion page button that's right down here in the center with the playhead parked over the clip you want to open. Got Fusion open. Now I like to work with a top-down mid-flow is what they call it in here, because I only want to see one viewer at a time. It actually makes processing easier. It gives a better screen real estate. So to get to there, I'm going to Workspace, Layout Presets, Fusion Presets, and mid flow. Okay, this is gonna give us sort of a top down workspace. And I just wanna use one of my two viewers. So I click this to make this the primary one. It's the number two viewer. And over in here, in the flow area where your script is being written, I can hold down, I'm using a Wacom, Wacom pen. I can hold down on here and, and zoom in and out. But if you have a mouse, just hold command or control as that backup goes to zoom in and out. And that goes the same over here in the viewer. Wherever your uh, cursor is pointed, when you zoom in, it goes right to that point. That's a great thing about Fusion that you don't get in the edit page when you're zooming around or panning around. Um, let me get to where my media out and my media in are over here and I'll situate these in a top-down view. When you're working in a color managed workflow, you're actually working by default in linear. So if I turn this Fusion view light off up here, you can see that's what the tracker is actually working with. This is the proper way to do compositing. Mathematically, this is how you should be doing things. So it, it gets rid of that extra step of having to set up a linear workflow. That's a topic for another tutorial. But let's get to tracking by selecting the media in, and I'm gonna type in shift space, that brings up a tool list. This is how you add all your effects here in Fusion. I'm gonna type in TRA, that gets us our point tracker. And we can see we have some green stuff over here that has appeared. This is our pattern box, that's basically the area it's looking for. And then the search area box is basically if it loses it, it has trouble, it's gonna look in that area around it. Um, before we actually do anything else, I wanna point out over here, we're looking at the media in. Whenever you track, you wanna be looking through the tracker to see if it's successful or not. So to look through it, I'm gonna click and drag and bring this on over here. Now you can see that white dot is on our two viewer. That means it's loaded over here. So we're gonna see the changes update as we do our tracking. Let's get to sort of a middle frame, I don't know, right around here. And I wanna track his little, his AirPods or earphones that are in there. And the way you move the trackers in Fusion, it's the upper left. So this is to move the box around for where the tracker is looking, the upper left. So grab that upper left corner and we're dragging and moving. We got a little zoomed in view. I'm gonna park it right on that area. And I wanna shrink this down so it's a lot smaller. Just dragging the edges makes this little pattern box smaller. And the search area can be, maybe you still leave it a little wide because he's walking left to right, but it could be shrunk down a little bit as well. So this doesn't jump to another area that it thinks is his white spot in front of his ear. Um, the other thing I'll say 
right off the start here is if you change your adaptive mode in the inspector over here on the right, right now it's set to none, which basically it says every single frame is gonna be looking at what the shape and the lighting is right here. Instead, there's a mode in here called best match. Best match doesn't take that much longer. And what it does is it computes that original pattern area with frames that are around it to see if it should update what it's actually looking for over time. So I'm choosing best match. And why don't we go ahead and start doing a track over here? We've got a track to end from where the current playhead is. Let's click that. And you can see, I'm going to zoom out. We got there, but uh oh, he went off screen. And so we have stuff that is not tracked as it goes off screen. We'll deal with that in just a minute. So hang with me. Let's go back to our first tracked frame. You can see our keyframes down here at the bottom. We don't have keyframes earlier on. So to get our, our him to track as he goes back towards the train station, we'll do this button right here, tracks backwards. And you can see it follows along. Oh, he hit a pole. We lost something. We have danger, Will Robinson. Anyway, so as he gets to there, we can deal with this in several different ways. The first one I want to show you is how you actually manually move uh, a point that's been tracked incorrectly. So to move left and right keyframes, it's the bracket keys on the keyboard. Left takes you backwards and you can see it, it all H-E double hockey stick skills loose right here. So as I move here, uh, it totally lost it as it goes behind the pole as expected because it doesn't know what it's looking for. But if you wanted to manually move it, you could move the point that the frame to that, what is this frame 38 where it goes off and you can take this point and move this over uh, to where you think it should be. So that's how you would manually move it. However, there's sort of a better way that you can let the computer do all this. And by the way, if you're ever manually moving stuff, be careful because this operates at a sub pixel level. The computer's smarter than us most of the time. So when you can let the computer do the work, let it do the work. And the other thing I was going to point out, when I first started working in this, I would start moving this pattern box, which is the upper left. That's how you tell the computer where to work. The center area here is where you do your manual work at. Okay, so, and this is adjusted after we already have tracking points. The next concept I want to talk about is last best frame. And so to get us across this pole, we're going to let the computer do the work, but we want to find the last best good tracking data frame. And the last good one is probably right here. This is frame uh, 39. And so I'm going to delete all the bad tracking data towards the beginning. And to do that, you can open up the spline editor up here and turn this on down here. And you can see all of the tracking data marks that have been made to delete just the section we want. You could hit this if you don't see everything, this little, this is like a zoom to fit sort of deal. And then you also have the uh, the magnifying glass, do this and you can sort of marquee select a, to get a, a view that fits in your window, right? And we're gonna select all the bad tracking data, which is from here on to the left. You can see those are selected, hit the delete key and those are gone. So to track around a pole or any other occlusion, Go to the other side of the pole where you can see the object you want to track again. So now I'm over here on frame 36. I'm going to move my tracking box, not the point, not the center one, but this upper left box back to where I want it to be searching for to be doing the tracking. And from here on, you can see we have no tracking in, in between there. That's fine. We're going to hit track backwards. And it looks like it did pick it up. I lost zoom a little bit. But until he goes out of frame, I'm gonna go back, 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 back. You can see we now have tracking data that goes behind the pole. And down here you can see there's no, there's nothing there except for a line. Well, the computer has figured out it had information on that side of the pole, this side of the pole, and it figured out the motion path it should have. So that's how you get around sort of occlusions and that sort of thing. Um, but what about the beginning and ends of these? We got uh, it goes haywire at the at the you know when it goes off frame. Well, the way we're gonna fix that is with a tool called gradient extrapolation. I know it's a big word for me too. Let's get to the beginning frame, and we're gonna go to the last best frame. Again, a key thing to think about and know about when you're doing tracking. Our last good frame looks like it's this one, 18. So I'm going back down here to the spline editor. I'm gonna delete all the bad tracking information. And we'll let him track as I scroll along, scroll around here, and we get to the end where it is no good. Right here, we're on frame 
uh, 110 it looks like. And this is our last good frame as he goes off screen this way. I'm gonna hit my zoom over here and then our little zoom tool to sort of see those keyframes. And we're gonna blow away all the keyframes at the end that are bad. And we still want this to continue off screen because I'm gonna put text on this and I want the text to follow off screen. So gradient extrapolation is how you do that. And the way you access it is with the spline editor open, I'm gonna right click control. Um, and we got right here, gradient extrapolation, click that. And you can see it's made a path, a line that basically follows the, it goes off screen in the same direction on both the beginning and end of the tracking data. So that gets you off screen. So if you have a text call out or whatever you're doing that involves tracking, I'm gonna hit Command F or Control F to go full screen. It will continue that motion path all the way off screen. See how that works? It's really, really handy. So since our track is good, we can actually lock this. If you select the tracker list, click this twice and it goes to like a circle. And now I can't accidentally bump it at all, okay? Now we have a solid XY translation point tracker path and we wanna merge some text on top of it to use as a call out. So up here, we have the merge node. If you're not used to Fusion yet, you're gonna be using merge all the time. And we're gonna take our background input, which is gonna be the footage. That's gonna go into the yellow input, the background input of merge, okay? And then the foreground is gonna be some text. We don't have text down here yet. Let's grab our text tool. That's this right here. It's the, th the text plus from the edit page. And if you wanna see what you're typing, when you're typing it, click and drag to load that in the viewer. We'll type New York. And because New York is a little classy, we'll change the font to die dot. Looks a little nicer. And to get this text on top of the footage, you take the gray output over here into the green foreground input of the merge. And once you do that, they've been merged together. The way I like to connect things, because this could end up being, have a whole lot of graphics, not just text, and you want this to track to our tracker position, the XY position we had, we can do that in the merge, if you go to the inspector, under the center parameter. This has an XY, you know what we're gonna do? We're gonna right click on center. I know it's weird, like there's no other way to know that you do this other than you right click on the word center text. We're gonna connect this to tracker one, tracker one offset position. So I'm slowing down here, tracker one, tracker one offset position. And just like that, you'll see the tracker position is basically the center of that text is stuck to the center of the the track that we did. Now it's actually, it's the center of the merge is what's there. So you could throw in a bunch of stuff in there and the center point of the merge is there. But what if I want it up higher? Well, the reason I did it as offset position is because we can actually go back to the tracker and adjust the offset position with some on-screen controls that are really handy. But to be able to do that, we actually need to unlock the, the tracker over here so that we can do some modifications. And then in the upper left, you'll see this little blue button. When you click on it, it turns blue. Now we can go in and zoom in and pull out a red line. See that red line? So we can adjust the offset position of whatever we're connected to, right? That yellow, that red line, it's gonna maintain that offset throughout the whole animation of the path. See how that works? Pretty snazzy. Anything that moves on a tracker, probably should have motion blur because uh, you know if you wanted to look cinematic things have motion blur in real life that's how our eyes even perceive things so to turn motion blur on you think of what's doing the moving the thing that's doing the moving is the merge tool in this instance it's moving the text and so anything that moves things has a motion blur switch in fusion so under settings is typically where it is and then we've got motion blur we'll turn that on crank up the quality and watch the computer struggle because it's rendering a little harder, but that might be too much blur. So if you wanted to still have it sort of legible, you could go to the shutter angle, which normally you're gonna have at 180. You could turn this down. It's a stylistic choice. Turn that down to 90, that makes it a little bit sharper. If you go back to the edit page, we don't have the graphic, why not? Well, it's because our media out is still piped into our tracker node over here. Uh, you can break this apart, and what we actually want to do is disconnect this and connect our composition that we did with the text, the output of there into media out. Now that we have that connected, we have the composition is fully being rendered back out to the, the edit page. 
Um, you might want to turn on, if you have trouble with playback, go to playback, render cache. I like to usually set this at user because I'm a control freak and user lets me uh, control things. Uh, once that's set to user, you need to also select the clip and go to um, render cache color output. And that basically renders everything downstream of the color page, which Fusion is also downstream of the color page. So you get this blue bar that turns to red once it's done rendering and you should get you know solid smooth playback. You could be done and check out right now, but I wanna show you something. If you go to the color page at this point, and let's make a, uh, you can see we've got our animation in there. Let's close this so you can see a little larger. Let's say we wanna change our gain. What we've just done, as soon as you change the gain on this clip, you've actually changed the color of the actual title too, and maybe you don't wanna do that. So the next trick I'm gonna show you is how you can use channel booleans set to clear to separate things out and work with them independently with a comp in the edit page. Let's just do this. Reset node grade. We're back to normal. Let's go to the edit page. And we're gonna make a duplicate of this comp right here by selecting it, holding Option Shift, drag up. That restrains it so it doesn't move left and right at all. And the top one's gonna be our graphic. The bottom one's gonna be our color correct. So I wanna remove the graphic from the bottom one. So I can see the bottom one, I'm gonna disable with D on the keyboard. So now I'm looking at the one underneath and to reset the fusion comp, I'll right click on it, say reset fusion composition, okay? Do I wanna do that? Yes, I really do. Now you'll see in the lower right, it still has that icon. Maybe in future versions they fix this. It's still cached, even that frame. Go to the color page, back to the edit page, you'll see it's, it's actually gone. So the bottom layer has the graphic removed from it. I can come over here and color correct this however I want to. Maybe I'll make it purple this time, who knows. Back to the edit page, I'll turn that top layer back on and we can't see through to the color correction we did. Well, here's where channel booleans comes in. Because we have this selected and it's on top, we can go to the fusion button, the fusion page button right there and we're gonna load a channel booleans tool. It's my favorite tool in Fusion. Hit shift space, BOL is the shortcut to get to it. I'm gonna click enter to accept it. And now what I wanna do is I wanna interrupt the background footage from hitting this merge over here. And so to insert this in between this, this part of the signal flow, you hold down shift while you drag this and it turns yellow to blue. And then the channel booleans is in there. It hasn't done anything quite yet though. What we need to do is under channel booleans operation over here, it's set to copy is sort of the default. We're gonna change this to make it clear. We're gonna use clear. So we're basically making the background clear, but you're still passing through all the tracking data that should still be in the flow here, as well as this is an important thing. You're maintaining the source resolution of the file. So I personally normally work at 1080p, but the source footage is larger. If I were to do a different method, which is involves changing this to media source being background, it messes up all the tracking data because it's looking at the timeline resolution. So channel booleans set to clear is what you wanna use. Go to the edit page and check this out. We actually have a white title on top of the colored footage. And at any time I can come back over here to the color page do a different color correct on this. Let me hit Z to zoom to fit. Okay, Z to zoom to fit. And I could change my offset to anything else, or I could change, you know, let's make that yellow. And that title has stayed where it is. If you don't wanna see that while you're color grading, hit this unmix button right here. And that sort of turns off all your composites. But that's the trick, channel boolean set to clear and you're in the clear. I just want you to know you are very appreciated. And because there's so much more to learn, I'll see you in the next video.